All right, Dylan, it's awesome to have you on the Bainbridge Podcast. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me. It's great. Dylan Cardin is from William Blair. He's an equity analyst of William Blair. I think what is um, what has made me so excited for this conversation is the fact that he has like an inside seat, an inside view of the public market. So, you know, Bainbridge, we obviously have the Bainbridge D to C index, but we're kind of observing it from the outside and the results of all this, but you get to be in on the calls. You get to go have the private meetings with the CFOs and the, and the management team. You get build and maintain your own models. You just have such a deeper, richer view of the public markets, particularly around e-com. So I'm excited to talk about that. But before we do that, why don't you I hope just I don't give a little brief um, <laughs> history? <laughs> I'm not worried about that. <laughs> but why don't you just give a quick introduction of yourself and your experience? Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, so I'm sell side equity analyst at William Blair. Um, I've been at Blair for about eight years. We kind of have a, a different approach to coverage um, where we're not as beholden to certain sectors. So I, I am most appropriately called a soft lines analyst, and I've spent much of my time covering apparel companies. You know, I like to say I grew up in the Briar Patch covering the really fun names like Abercrombie, Urban, uh, Francesca's, for those of these months, you know, might remember that one. Um, everything from Vera Bradley used to cover the handbag companies, Nordstrom, all the way through. And then more recently, that's kind of evolved. Um, and a lot of sort of the newer entrants into the space, your Stitch Fixes, Revolves, um, Allbirds, Brilliant Earth, um, Warby Parker, companies like that. It's kind of been where the coverage has sort of migrated to naturally over time. And then just for fun, I sprinkle in some stuff like National Vision, um, which is an eyeglass maker, Amazon, which, you know, is, is an everything uh, maker. So, you know, a, a little bit of this and a little bit of that, but it's a broad sort of overview or spectrum of kind of consumer more broadly. Um, yeah, and before that, I covered casinos and hotels for a firm called Telsey Advisory for about four years, which is really fun space, really dead space, though. So I'm glad I kind of got out of that. And, and journalist... Sort of journalist, private investigator by training, um, kind of led me into the wonderful world of research. So, lifelong researcher, I guess, is the way I would, you know, overview it all. Well, you, you can't just drop that you're a private investigator and then be like, you know, <laughs> let's move on. Can't, like, can't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I could probably be the most interesting part of this call. Yeah, so I, yeah, I, I got an English degree um, and tried to monetize that, which is incredibly difficult. Um, my options, I thought, and I and I did it because I thought that I was going to go into journalism. And the the sort of the, the the fork in the road, graduating college, thinking that you're going to be a journalist, is you either go to journalism school, which I saw as a very you know bleak option, or you go to Tupelo and you start out writing obituaries and classifies and things like that. So neither of those was very attractive. So I used a little bit of old school nepotism, and my father, who was a lawyer. Um, worked with a private investigations firm in London. And I said, well, that's really interesting. Um, maybe I can go and, and do some of that. So I, yeah, I spent two years in London doing, I, you know, I off balance sheet due diligence is the way you describe it. But really what it was, was clients were private equity firms, rich individuals, family offices, looking to do business in Russia, the Middle East, Africa, places where you have zero visibility. And we would just use a network of sources, um, you know, to, to kind of, see who people were and whether or not they were, you know, of, of character that you wanted to be in business with. So, yeah, it was fun stuff. Did a little bit of trash diving. Did that? Did a little bit of phone calling. <laughs> really? Lagging, they call it. Oh, yeah, yeah. A um, little bit of uh, uh, surveillance. Yeah, a little bit of everything. <laughs> did, did, did the experience, like, change your view of humanity? Did, did you become a cynic or did it? You know, maybe you're already. I don't know. I, I've always run pretty cynical. I, you know what? It, what it did do in, in reality, I think it's a great. It's a job that people don't really know that exists. People think about. It, they think, oh, people like stalking people's wives to see if they're cheating, right? Which is which is a very real job. But it, ours was much more. I looked at almost every single industry in a lot of different countries over a two year period. So for someone that doesn't really know kind of where they're headed professionally, you know, you're looking at oil and get. You know, you're looking at uh, oil and gas companies out of Switzerland or Russian oligarchs, the aluminum trade out of Russia or, you know, all of its cell phones in Africa, right? You kind of get this broad spectrum of, of the world. And, and then the research component of it 
was really what struck with me, right? The same kind of probably inkling of why I wanted to be a journalist. And I said, okay, great. You know, there's all these different ways that you can kind of take research, including from a financial perspective. So it was from that experience that I first identified I wanted to go into sell side research. And then that took like seven yeah. years to actually actualize. But, you know, that was kind of the, the initial launch pad of, of wanting to do, you know, wanting to sort of be where I am right now, which is kind of interesting. But no, I mean, yeah. The world's a terrible place. I mean, we had this one. Yeah, I mean, it's it was it was a lot. You're dealing with any time, particularly London. You're dealing with a lot of extremely wealthy people who just you know treat the world as their kind of playground. And yeah, so it, it, there, I probably have some part of my worldview that's been colored by some some of those old clients. Yeah, sure, I'll I'll, I'll give that to you. <laughs> <laughs> tell tell me about. Um... You know, I don't think a lot of people are, are super familiar with the kind of uh, reporting mechanics and sort of like the, the you know, as a company goes from private, you know, hey, I've raised all this VC money and then hooray, we have the IPO and our pictures, you know, ringing the bell. And then, you know, I think people like just look at the stock price, right? And they're, they're kind of aware that there's these filings. But like what, what is sort of the cadence of a, of a public D2C company, you know? And from the public yeah. market standpoint. Traditionally, and, and so like my relationship with the company typically starts, I, I like to engage companies really early on because I think that's where you really build some of the most organic relationships, right? Um, but, you know, more typical is that you'll have a company. So how early? Find some, I, I like pre, I like the bootstrap companies that don't have any investors in them <laughs> that early. Right, like pre-seeking Holy outside months. capital. So you're doing these meetings. Where they're like these are like ten million dollar, five million dollar revenue. Or? Yeah, yeah, just, just smaller. Wow. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And that's what I like to do because, again, you're not. There's no agenda there other than, you know, the the mutual the the, the mutual benefit is that you can kind of tell me what you're seeing from your vantage, being in the front line, sort of trying to sell goods to consumers, and I can you know, have yeah. a conversation kind of like what we're having now, where I provide some insight or perspective, hopefully into what this world of, of, of you know, sort of uh, uh, institutional investors are. So, but, you know, more typical, I would say that that's, that's rare when I can really do that um, or have that opportunity, but, but, and more typical is that you've got a company that's got, you know, a couple rounds of financing behind it. They're either looking for another one and through that process kind of instinctually understand that the exit from there will be, a public offering, right? So, for example, yeah. I met with ICR was a big conference that we just had. The industry had, um, I guess, uh, Monday through Wednesday of this week. Met with a company that you know, similar idea. You know, they've had about a five year track record. They've raised a little bit of money. They're trying to raise more now, um, with an idea to go public in kind of mid twenty four, right? So, okay. right now, so call it right, sort of a, a, a year and a half out. Um, is where they're kind of starting to think about what it is that you're kind of, you know, speaking around. Um, and it's, how do we present the story? Cause they've, the story has been pitched at this point, right? You've got some money in there, right. but how do we pitch it? How do we think about trying to pitch it to the broader public equities landscape? Right. And yeah. a lot of that conversation is, and this is where I think it's most helpful to maybe have someone like myself, hopefully, not to be too kind of cocky about it, but, um, you know, because the, the, the conversation or where most the instinct is to look at a bunch of other companies and what they've done and just copy that. Right. And so this is where you right. get a metric like LTV to CAC. This is where it just explodes because maybe that made sense for one company at some point or a handful of companies. And all of a sudden everyone just latches onto it and you get to the point where when Madewell, Madewell wanted to go public in. Oh, what was that? Like 19, I think it was. And that was the first time I had seen an LTV to CAC metric in like a traditional retailer pitch deck, right? So these metrics have, and what Chewy did, yeah, Chewy put in metrics where it was spend per customer per year. And for them, that was a great metric because yeah. it just showed this really nice, consistent trend line. And then after Chewy did it, a lot of other companies started to think they needed to do it. And it wasn't as attractive because of course, you know, if yeah. you're buying dog food versus a pair of pants, there's no way you're going to show the right. same kind of consistency or repeat spending, right? So where I think it's where I get sort of uh, most engaged is trying to help companies not go at it from the outside in, but the the inside out as far as thinking about sort of brand value, you know, what their actual kind of relationship is to their customer. What What is the DNA of the business that you really need to sort of get across in a couple bullet points to express, you know, why this is a sustainable 
engaging, you know, long yeah. business. And, and that's, that's going to be different for each company, you know? Um, but the, yeah. and so those metrics, you know, relate to, market of, yeah, sorry, go ahead. no, 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 go, please take me somewhere else in the market. Well, it, along those lines, like, can the market absorb those nuances? You know, I mean, if you yeah, are a great question. too much of a snowflake, are people like, I don't have time to deal with this. <laughs> like, I just want to know the LTV to CAC or, you know, spend per customer or whatever. No. Yeah, that, that, that is a hundred percent accurate. Um, the default is to go the easy way, right? Show the LTV to CAC, show that it's good compared yeah. to others that have come before you. Um, you know, put in you know, put in the arbitrary twenty five percent top line growth to a billion dollars in three years, right? Like all, all the stuff that people sort of think the street needs here. I, I got into a not a, a uh, someone a, a private company the other day asked me what do I consider to be a growth company, and I said ten percent top line. Yeah, growth, right. That that's a lot lower than I think you'll hear from anyone else, right? And so yeah, a lot of people are going to dismiss. Yeah the way that I want to go about it. And and it's not just because it's harder too, right? Like, but it should have been, it should be easy. I guess that's where I kind of draw the distinction. If that's hard to do, if it's hard for you to kind of distill the, the identity and the value of the brand, right? It might be that it's hard to kind of put it in metrics. I get that part, but if it's hard to even sort of speak to, that's a whole other separate issue. Right. And so I think it's a worthwhile exercise, you know, just even, even just taking, listening to me or, or just even having a conversation, whether or not you think that I'm going to be the one because you think you need the 25% growth to get the investors, right? Like I get all that. I'm not going to, I'm not a franchise analyst is the way I put it typically. <laughs> yeah. I could probably be more right, commercial right, if I wanted. Right. Yeah, 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 right. Um, but yeah, no, that you're right. You're, the instinct is, is right. It, it's much more that you kind of look at the standard comp tables. Perfect example is comp tables, right? And, 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 and comp tables mm-hmm. where you have, whatever you think the the relevant public companies are that you should be matched up against and what they trade at. So the idea is that, yeah. you know, you're Viore, right? So you've got Lulu and Nike and, you know, maybe Warby's on there, right? And that spits out a nice little me- multiple that is say, okay, 15 times EBITDA, 18 times EBITDA, that's, that's our benchmark. And that's fine. Nothing against comp tables, but yeah, it, it doesn't it doesn't at all get at the nuance between those different brands, right? And speak to why yeah. a, why someone should be much more invested in a business like yours because of the, the the unique aspects and value proposition that it offers. So I don't know. It it's it's something that I think is at least a worthwhile exercise yeah. to think about as a thought experiment. Yeah, that's interesting. And and. I think it would be helpful for people to maybe better understand, you know, what a sell side analyst, you know, is doing, like, how do, you know, you're not getting paid by the companies to come and cover them. And you do a ton of work and you're attending all these meetings and building and maintaining models. So like, what is the business model behind that? And, and, you know, what, I think there's a perception of how that might influence it, but what's your take on, you know, whether it's, there is an influence on that or not. Yeah. So yeah, you're right. It's, it's a really interesting part of, of the financial ecosystem. So historically it evolved from when, when trading got commoditized, right? When there was, there was no way to differentiate yeah. yourself on pricing from a trading standpoint. And I think that was in like the sixties or seventies. It's kind of like healthcare in, in why healthcare got introduced from a labor standpoint. It was a way to attract yeah. workers. Research was a way that you could offer your your trading partners added value, right? So you trade with us, sure. Right. We're going to be just we're going to be priced just like the next guy. Execution is probably going to be pretty comparable, but we offer you an opinion on the companies that you might be interested in buying or selling. So it emerged as sort right. of a add on product to the sales and trading desk, and its its value is ethereal, right? Like in theory, we are driving mind share, you know, and instigating trading, right? So we're, we're attached. The budget that we have draws from our trading desk, right? And, and like the perfect yeah. example, client from an institutional firm, a mutual fund, hedge fund, whatever it might be, pension fund calls me and I give them an idea. Hey, you know what? Abercrombie is going to be a great buy for the next year. They read the report, yeah. listen to what I have to say, agree with me. 
and for the for the effort, if you will, go and buy Abercrombie stock through our trading desk. That covers the trader right. salary. The commission on that covers trading, the sales guy who represents them, and theoretically my my cut as well. I'm right. because I'm not where the rubber touches the road. I'm further down the pecking order there, um, just from a compensation standpoint. But that's right. that's the basic thrust of the idea. It's it's access to mindshare for the yeah. trading clients, right? And and whether or not Right. You know, there's a lot of, well, of course, Reg FD, what happened was that a big part of a trading desk budget is going to be IPOs, right? That's a, that's a huge um, yeah. sort of uh, revenue source for any sort of sales and trading desk. And so what happened was that these research firms started jockeying for a position just to be at the spigot as it relates to essentially banking, right? Essentially follow on yeah. IPOs, secondaries, whatever it might be. Um, and therefore their credibility and their, you know, right, um, got called into question. And that really came to a head in, you know, the late 90s, early 2000s, when there was just these research channels that were caught on tape, effectively saying, yeah, I wouldn't touch that company with a 10 foot pole, but, you know, we got to, we, we do so much banking. Yeah, we're buying <laughs> yeah, right, exactly. The, I think it was the Morgan Stanley guy that got fired uh, for having a neutral rating on Enron. Great example. He was like the one negative guy on Enron, and it was Marilyn I don't know. Morgan. That could yeah. be a problem. But... It could be a problem, right? He saw it, and they were like, you know what? Because you're such a good researcher, you're going to get out of here. You're going to get out of our research department. So that they changed those rules in 2002, 2003, uh, where they really kind of, and really all they really did was made tighter, tighter laws around uh, dissemination. So like, there's a guy at our firm, Nick Heyman, wonderful man, who's covered. He's covered GE for as long as I've been alive. He started covering GE in 1982, and he would tell stories nice. about the, the model used to be you would get in tight with management. You'd go out for lunch. You'd have a two martini lunch, and he would, he would mention that they're going to raise the dividend the next quarter. And you could sit on the information because you were the only one. You could go sober up, and then the right. next day you could come back and you could right. go to the, the hoot and say, hey, guys, GE is going to raise the dividend next quarter. That was the model, right? Um, and that all changed, yeah. obviously, and for the better. But you know, I, I do think that yeah it's a spectrum but yeah there's still a part of research that's driven by banking and relationships no question right i i think if you're really thinking about being in the industry for a long period of time it, it just behooves you to be as because where you really lose it is credibility with investors right again getting back to kind of the whole model right. you need those people to trust you to right. trade with you right and so the more that you're out there selling that's them right. wood you know, that's a short career potentially, right? Unless, right. and then it gets down to incentive schemes at individual banks and what have you. But that's, that's kind of how I yeah. feel. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's, that's, that's great. That, and that gives a really good context. Let's, let's switch gears a little. Um, it, you know, I thought you um, <clears throat> had this really interesting observation about like the kind of, the, you know, the kind of recent history of retail and in the e-com, yeah. you know, kind of starting with like, the, you know, the retailers in order to grow, added stores, you, you know, if you don't mind, would you sort of go through that? Because I think that gives a really good history of the, of the space, which maybe people that are kind of newer to e-com, you know, it's like, hey, it didn't just start, you know, five years ago. Uh, this thing started a <laughs> yeah. long time ago. I mean, what's interesting is that the commercialization of the internet was the mid 90s, right? And if, and this is, I think, totally circumstantial, but if you look at inflation for, let's just take, I'm, I talk mostly about apparel. So I'm going to, most of what I'm speaking to is apparel, but I think it has ramifications across a lot of other discretionary categories. But if you look at inflation, yeah. 1995 was essentially, you haven't seen any inflation since that point in most discretionary categories. Inflation for a lot of discretionary categories was seen actual inflationary trend up until that point. And then since then, it's been effectively flat. And, and it gets mm -hmm. into the kind of what you're speaking to is sort of like, what is the background in the history of, of, of this industry or other sort of industries like that? In the, in the late 90s and early 2000s is when you saw a lot of IPOs for companies that you now would recognize as sort of mature, old, um, <laughs> dead in the water retailers. L Brands, you know, formerly The Limited, Abercrombie, Macy's, Gap, yeah. Macy's goes back further. But that was really when kind of a lot of this flow of, of, of public companies really happened. And to mm -hmm. attract investors, uh, these companies need to have a growth plan. It gets back to what is growth? Is, is growth 25% growth? Right. You know, is that a responsible pattern of growth or is it 
10 or 5% if you know that's sustainable over decades. And the easiest way for these right. companies to show that they were going to grow was to open stores. So throughout 2000 and really into the, uh, into the you know, Great Recession in 08, 09, all these companies were just opening up stores like, like crazy, right? Um, and, and really forsaking right. a lot of more traditional channels, namely wholesale, right? And, and sort of going direct to consumers. So this is where like Coach pulled themselves out of Nordstrom more materially and started opening up Coach stores literally in the same mall down the hallway, right? Um, and, wow. and what happened yeah. there... Yeah, and then and then you get to store counts that are, you know, American Eagle. I think at its peak had eight hundred stores. Macy's, of course, had a thousand. Uh, Gap had a thousand. Right. Victoria's Secret, I think, so it was starts like building on itself because it, it starts creating demand yeah. from the developers to build more malls, and, and so they're like, hundred percent. Yeah, yeah, the over storing yeah. just took off. Right? Yeah, and, and it's and it's like the every because everyone else is doing it. You think there's the opportunity that you can do it as well, right? And, and w the cover that they had right. was that there was no real online threat at that point, right? Like from 95 to call it 2005, the sale of apparel online was like, you know, one, two, three percent, right? It was really imping along. Right. And this is where you get some – I wish I've, – I've gone and tried to look for these quotes, but I haven't been able to find them. But this is where you get, you know, people like Mickey Drexler – um, you know, saying, oh, the internet's, n no one's ever going to buy a cashmere sweater on the internet, right? Because they need the touch mm -hmm. and feel and the, the trust that there's a trust deficit, right? So stores are allowed yeah. this capacity and obviously 08, 09 puts a wrinkle in it, but stores just, they kept, the, the industry kept opening up stores all the way through to 2015, 2016. And then a really interesting thing started wow. to happen. That was a time the online penetration in apparel reached 15, one, 5% in 2016. And you can go back and look wow. at early, early online adopters. Books is the most obvious because of Amazon. Amazon just turbocharged the online adoption of books. You can look at books. You can use con consumer right. electronics. Office supplies actually happens to have been an early online migrator. And that 15% range is where consistently you start seeing a more one-for-one -one trade off between uh, cannibalization of retail. So it almost becomes a one-for-one, one, you know, 100 basis points moving online is about a 1% decline in the retail sales of that industry. So all these companies oh that God, opened up really? thousands That's of stores, cool. mm -hmm, I could, I'll, I'll, I'll share the charts with you, I have them. Uh, all these companies just got these hugely bloated retail uh, channels just as the internet was taking off. And so then you get into 16, 17, 18, where this is where stores become a four-letter word, right? uninvestable, right? Macy's is uninvestable. Gap is uninvestable. L Brands is uninvestable because they essentially have to unwind all of that, all of that development. And just to give you a sense of how severe that was, there's 200 MSAs, metropolitan statistical areas, big city areas. There's 200 sort of larger urban areas in the United States, over 200,000 people. So if you have a reasonable store footprint, if you look at like a free people uh, or an Aritzia um, you know, brands, uh, brands that are really quite, you know, rational in their, in their store rollout coach, it tends to be about 200 stores, <laughs> 200, 250. You can have a couple stores in New York, right? I mean, it, it, there's not a yeah. lot of white space to have a thousand stores. So that's what you're, you, these right. companies essentially had to go from a thousand to 300 in the best case scenario, right? So that gives you a sense of the scale of the issue. And then at that same time, yeah. Right. Because because these companies, these mature or sort of legacy retailers were so hobbled by their own irresponsible expansion, the narrative that it sort of emerged out of that was look how great and look how, uh, you know, favorable the online channel looks. Right. No, you and I going back five years could have started a khaki company. There was no overhead. We just need to scrounge up a couple right. of dollars for production in China, maybe some marketing. And that's it. That's just it. You can go and you can go on Facebook and just market the crap out of it. And there, boom, there's your 25 million. And, and so that's where the sort right. of next generation of what people viewed to be competitively advantaged digital only platforms emerged in that wake of the store closures that had to happen to their primary competitors. Right. Yeah. And, and kind of getting back to the mid 90s and how there has been no inflation in this space. The inflation that you have seen in the United States has been largely non-discretionary. Housing, healthcare, education. Anything that's discretionary that's not an iPhone has been deflationary. And that's just simply the, the net mm -hmm. effect of that is that wallet share has been coming out. We used to spend 17% of our income on a close back in the 70s. 
that's 3% yeah. right now, yeah. right? It's just been this massive crowding out. So there's no, there's no, if people like to talk about TAM. Wait, there's go no through TAM that again. To, to, yeah. Get, explain that again, because I think that's, this is a really yeah. interesting point. So you're, you're talking about sort like of share of wallet erosion due to inflation. Exactly. Right. If you think about, so if you look at, if you look at over time, this idea of 2% inflation, this is why I think this is so misunderstood. Yeah. If you look at 2% inflation in the United States, which is the Fed's target, right? 2%. Um, first of all, do you, has anyone they're, kind of laid out why it. we- They're doing a great job. They're doing... <laughs> <laughs> that- that that two percent inflation historically the, the 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 sort of academic idea of inflation, which is also kind of crazy, is that okay? Well, why do you even need inflation, right? Why can't things just be sort of stagnant in price? Wouldn't that be great, right? Um, one of the ideas behind inflation is that you need to incentivize people to spend, right? So if you know the flat screen TV is going to mm -hmm. be more expensive in the future, you're not going to buy it now, right? And so there's a whole growth for growth like aspect, yeah. even all the way down to the inflationary level. But yeah, if you actually if you actually look at the categories of inflation over the last, call it 20, 30 years, it's really, and without exaggerating, been housed in those three categories, healthcare, housing, and education. That's your 2%. Everything else is flat to deflationary. Food does this, by and large. Gasoline does this. Anything that's sort of a consumer product is, is more or less flat or, or, or deflationary. And, and the net effect of that is that if you look at you can get you know cons, uh, you can get uh, PCE data, personal consumption expenditure data, and you can look at yeah. how much we dedicate to certain categories of wallet, right? And yeah, we used to spend seventeen percent of our income on on apparel, on clothing in the nineteen seventies, right? And that is now three percent. It's because it now costs what a hundred thousand dollars to send a kid to college or something crazy like that. I mean, it's it's not right. Um, and the interesting thing about those three categories, healthcare, housing, education, someone else pays for all of that. You've got health insurance, you've got mortgages, and you've got student loans. So that right. allowed for unchecked right. runaway. And, and so that, that's, that's all I was saying about that. But, but it's interesting because then the, the point I really wanted to draw from that is that you're not, if you're an apparel company and you're growing 20%, you're not doing that because of the industry. You're doing that because you're taking that 20% from somewhere else, right? And yeah. so it's really... I, it's important because it, it, it's, it's, if you're going to have a st strategy in apparel, you have to understand that fundamental aspect of the business, right? If you're growing 20%, it's really coming from somewhere else, right? The fact that off price right. has gotten so big in the post-recession era has come entirely almost as a result of department stores getting smaller, right? The online right. guys growing so quickly from 15 all the way to 2020 was because of that closing of retail from the mature store base. Right. And of course, consumers moving online because, you know, it becomes a manifest destiny to some extent. Right. So that takes right. you up to 2020. Right. And okay. the really fascinating thing that's happened really since 21 is now we have in the public domain those digitally native companies for investors to pick over. Right. right. At the same time, the mature retailers have done, you know, have now spent five or so years in some instances more than that, including accelerated years in 2020, 21, closing stores. So some of the healthiest businesses yeah. right now are actually a company like Abercrombie. You know, Abercrombie is in a lot okay. healthier position, I would argue, than a company like, a, like an Allbirds, right? Um, because they're sort of much more further along in their store rollout, because they have sort of a history of, of operating, because they have a, a more healthy mix of online and retail sales. So it's an interesting point in, in, in sort of this whole process because now we've evened it out a little bit, right? And the risk, of course, would be that the digitally native companies that have come public since 21 repeat the sins of, you know, the 1990s and the early 2000s, where they say, we're going to have a thousand stores, right? Or, or more likely is that they're just going to open up stores too quickly, right? Um, that they're going to say, hey, we can have a hundred stores, so let's open 20 a year. Yeah, you, you made this point where you said, um, I can't remember the company, but they were like talking about their uh, retail expansion being like 50%, but their growth was like 20, some number yeah. less. And, and I was curious, like if you could sort of go through that again, like, because you yeah. were like you and all the other analysts were like, you guys see the problem here. Right. And they're like, no, 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 it's a good <laughs> thing. <laughs> yeah. 
I, I may not say the name of the company per se, but uh, it's. I remember too. I, I once looked at a banking presentation, and they were all they were all happy. They were all proud of themselves, and they showed a chart where it was revenue, and then it was labor or, or, yeah. or sort of employment. Right. This has been what revenue and banking has done. This has been yeah. how much we've been hiring. It's like you guys see the problem with that, right? Like you're yeah. just becoming less efficient. But yeah, this would this it, uh, well, Duluth is a company I can speak to this as well. Like this one company you're okay. speaking to uh, reported the other day. It's, it's all birds. We'll just say what it is. They reported their third quarter, and they they were really proud of the fact that I'm going to get these numbers wrong, but directionally they're right. They're really they were really proud that their retail sales, their sales in stores, right, had grown call it forty percent over the year. And yeah. yet us analysts were looking at the underlying numbers and drivers and saying, well, yeah, but the number of stores you have has increased 70%, right? And so if you want to talk about, you know, health of a business, you're not necessarily a healthier business if you're opening up stores faster than your revenue, right? It's the same idea with revenue and employment, right? The, the underlying driver should be the two things that, that make for a sale, right? The, the essentially the distribution and the customer should equal a rate that's, that's growing greater than those two drivers in theory, right? Um, easiest example is active customers and spend per customer, right? You're, that should equal revenue that's yeah. above both of those, right? Because if you're growing customers at a faster right. clip and your revenue is not keeping up, those customers are spending less and it gets to, you know, the, the overall right. health of that customer. Same thing here with stores. If you're growing stores 70%, but those stores yeah. that, that the revenue across those stores is only growing 40%, you're effectively opening up stores that aren't comping, that aren't seeing positive same store sales on a year over year basis, which is which totally takes away the credibility of opening up stores. Right. Well, do do stores do they hit like kind of a hundred percent efficacy like day one, or did, is there a ramp to them or is it the ramp not really meaningful. Well, it's it's and they're supposed to uh, ramp, right? Yeah. And, and, and instinctually that makes sense, right? You open a store, usually you're opening up a store in a new market, right? So dig, for digital yeah. companies, it's a little bit different because they're opening up stores in areas where people already know they exist because they've shopped them online, which is where this gets a little bit kind of fuzzy. Sure. But in, in theory, you're opening up right. a store in a new market. And even for digital companies, you're opening up that store to expand the market. Everyone talks about this. Open up a store right. in Boston. Right. In the in, in the second year, that market has grown anywhere from eighty to one hundred and fifty percent. Some companies talk about two hundred percent growth in that market. That would be retail and online, right? So the overall okay. market is doing two x what you were doing historically. So yeah, you want a store to open. Typically, stores okay. open anywhere from sixty to seventy percent productivity. It's called. And productivity being kind of the average fleet, okay. right? So if all your stores are growing, yep. if you do a million on average across any store you have, your 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 typical new store will come up at, you know, call it 600,000, 700,000. And then over the next four years, okay. it ramps to the fleet average, right? That's that's what you typically see. Well, it takes that long. Some, it does, yeah. And and some, some digital hmm. retailers, Duluth is one. We'll see with Allbirds, you know, it could be another. For whatever reason, they're opening up these stores, and then they're actually seeing declines in volume. And Allbirds even said on their call when yeah. asked that question, and you, you can go back to the transcript, and it was asked to them about three different ways. They actually acknowledged that there was so much volume in some of those older stores that they don't think they're actually going to get back to those volumes. So you're almost seeing this like inverse store waterfall, which is tough because you know right yeah. now they're budgeting out that those stores should grow. It's tough if you get into a position where that's not the case. And again, I'll keep mentioning it, but Duluth right. is exhibit one for when that goes wrong. Oof. Okay. Dylan, what a common, you know, <clears throat> the sort of conventional wisdom in D to C, um, you know, is like, oh, I need to grow. So I need to go omni channel, right? So, like, you know, I'm going to go into, you know, maybe I'll go Amazon and I'll start going wholesale and Target or whatever, you know, the right channels are. And, and I should start opening stores. Does are there examples of that working out well for um, ecom brands, or is it too early to say? No, I mean you know it's it's it, it kind of again speaks to like what it, like 
this is the risk, right? You you see what everyone else is doing, and you say, okay, well, that's what I need to do too. And that's where you go to certain areas of cities, you know them well, where you've got all these DTC brands that have just gone and opened up a store all next to each other in a row, right? I mean, <laughs> you know, again, not to kind of call it individual companies. And some of those stores even look like one another, like they've hired the same design consultant or something, right? So, you right. know, it, it gets back to... Aritzia is a great example for retail rollout. Aritzia, which is a Canadian women's clothing company, phenomenal company, phenomenal company for lots of reasons. But but one of the reasons is their mer- their their uh, retail strategy. They will wait upwards of five plus years before they they want the exact location to be right for them. They don't just want to be on Lower Broadway. They want literally one address. So if that address isn't available, they'll wait. They have an in-house architecture team, a five-person large architecture team that designs every store uniquely and uniquely fit for whatever market they're going into, right? So every store looks different, right? And so, that, and that's not what these brands are doing. A lot of these companies are going out and they're saying, okay, well, we can have 100 stores. We're targeting 20% growth. This is where that whole arbitrary 20, 25%, that's what growth is. That's where this goes away because you're saying, okay, well, we need to hit 20%. How do we do that? Well, we can have 100 stores, so let's open 20 a year, right? That, that's where that, it, that's top down, which ignores a lot of the fundamentals of and the identity of the brand. So, you know, I, I think for some brands, right. a combination wholesale, retail, online makes sense. Allbirds is clearly one. I think wholesale could be a bigger piece of their business than people maybe initially expected. A wholesale serves a very real purpose, right? But as far as someone that's out there now, right. who you would say, you know, who, someone, a, a brand that's existed called in the last like 10 years, who's really doing it well. I mean, arguably Warby Parker has messed up their retail, right? I and mean, the fact that Warby Parker doesn't make money and they have 200 stores, that's interesting. The fact that they're now having to go back and put doctors in stores yeah. could tell you that they didn't really understand their business in the first place, right? right? To not think that you need a doctor and an eyeglass, yeah. thing, right? So that's one that uh, it's just right. hard to know who's really doing the Omni well at this point, because I think it's such early days for a lot of these brands, right? And, and you see a lot of them at greater risk yeah. of messing it up than, than, you know, knocking it out of the park, so to speak. Yeah. Aritzia, I remember you talking about Aritzia because a number, you gave me a number that just blew me away was that, it, I, I think I'm going to get this right, 85% of their sales are at full price. Yeah, that's right. That's Boot barn. like Boot barn's similar too. That's astounding. That's shooting, that's astounding. That's shooting the lights out. That's that's like I think you know people are grasping for metrics that really help understand the underlying health of a brand. That's one of them. You know, repeat spending, full price spending, um, you know, organic engagement, word of mouth. Like there's things that you can really yeah. kind of assess. Like what is the health of the brand? And the health of the brand is most people that rock up to your business will pay whatever it is that you ask them to pay, you know? And it's not because you're gouging them. It's because you're offering right. real value, whatever that might be, be it price, right. be it in the case of Aritzia, it's all private label. So here's the greatest, here's the one vignette or snippet for Aritzia that you need to, that, that sort of speaks to that. There's two types of down, gray down and brown down. One is good, one is bad. I don't, I forget which one. I think gray down is the higher quality down. Aritzia puts the gray down and their puffer jacket and Canada Goose puts the, sh- the, the worst down, the, less, the inferior down, in their jackets. And Canada Goose charges more, <laughs> much more than, than, than Aritzia does for their jackets, right? So, like, and is the consumer going to know? No, Aritzia doesn't put a sign out that says, hey, you know, we've got, don't look at right. Canada Goose, look at well, us, we've no got this great down. going up Everest of the thing. Yeah, in your, in your super puff. And yet, though, you talk to anyone that wears an Aritzia yeah. puffer jacket, they swear by how warm it is, right? So anyway, it's stuff like that. Oh, that really? I think, you know, That's yeah. <laughs> yeah. What, what, um, what do you think is pricing power the, the, the true measure of a brand? I mean, would, would like <clears throat> repeat purchases be a, a measure of a brand? Yeah, repeat purchases, I think. Um, full price selling. Um, I think there's some value to NPS. It's tough because NPS, everyone measures it a little bit differently, 
right? So like I asked uh, Revolve. Yeah. Revolve doesn't disclose their NPS. And I asked them why. And they said, well, because, you know, it's, how do you want to measure it, right? And I actually saw I was in a presentation the other day. Someone put up a Madewell NPS for a comparison that was negative five. <laughs> so, you know, I've never seen a negative NPS. I didn't even know that was possible. I guess it is possible in theory, the way you measure it. But anyway, so I, 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 I but I think the underlying goal of NPS is correct. And it's like, you know, word of mouth, organic, you know, how much do you actually need to promote your brand and how much is your brand being promoted by those that use it? Right. Um, what else? Right. Reviews, you know, I mean, how, like how many yeah. people are taking the time to write a review for you? And are those reviews, obviously whether or not they're positive matter. Um, but yeah, I, I think real measure of a brand are, are things that kind of get at, the stuff that is harder one. Cause if you go and you open up 20% new stores in any given year, that's not focusing on what's supposed to be going in the stores, right? Like you need to start every decision for the business with what is the product itself and then find the, the most appropriate way to distribute and to speak to that customer. I, I think it's really, which is harder yeah. <laughs> by and large. Yeah. And less, less harder to just, you know, yeah. Sorry, I cut you off. Um, no, no, you didn't. You, Dylan, what, what's it's it's a uh, it's what is it? It's January thirteenth of twenty three. Um, what is the kind of feeling about what twenty twenty three will hold for ecom? At so least among it, it, public it's, investors, it's, it's fortuitous because I'm just again coming off this conference, um, and this conference is called ICR. It's ICR itself is an outside IR firm, right? You're probably familiar with it. And it's a collection of, you know, again, those sort of like Abercrombie was there, um, American Eagle was there, Lululemon was there. Uh, so these older, more mature legacy retailers and the newer entrants, right? They have a private day. The last day, Wednesday, was all private companies. Wolf and Shepherd um, was one of them. Uh, some other companies that I think are a little bit smaller, but, you know, all to say, like it's Ever Eve. Um, so it's a nice, way to kind of speak to a bunch, a bunch of investors quickly and kind of see how the take the temperature of a lot of different companies that are actually trying to make their budgets right now. And what shocked me and, and everyone that I spoke to, all the clients and companies I spoke to, is just how positive sentiment was. I mean, you would think with the headline risks and right everything going on that these companies wouldn't have any capacity to really kind of find uh, a, a ray of sunshine, so to speak. But, uh, and there's, uh, it's not sort of maybe of the purview of this conversation, but I, I think it boils down to the fact that there's a lot of tailwinds going into next year, right? Inflation theoretically eases, mm -hmm. comparisons get easier. Um, freight costs are coming down, are back to where they were. Labor costs ease, right? So you've, even if you get some sort of macro malaise, you still have a lot of support from an earnings and demand standpoint, right? So and Jamie Dimon just changed his mm -hmm. tune too, right? It's not going to be this economic hurricane. It's going to be a little bit more like a drizzle, right? So I think a lot of people mm -hmm. are feeling that even if you do get some sort of pressure, and if it is a recession, it's been the most telegraphed recession of all time too, right? We've just been waiting by the phone right. for it. So, you know, I think people are taking a, a, a happier view as it relates to it maybe not being such a major overhang and that you have very real margin support, right? So that's, it's a hopeful message for any company. Right. As it relates to DTC yeah. and, and these digital brands, this is where it's going to get very, very interesting because the, the messaging from the investor side is pretty clear. If you don't make money, right, if you don't make positive free cash flow, I, it's a very difficult for me to own your stock. Right. Unless you're early yeah. stage SaaS or, you know, unless there's a real reason why, you know, you're not making money. But if you're a consumer brand at 50 plus percent gross margin and you're 300, 400, 500 million in top line for you to not be, it's like, it's like a kid being kicked out of the house. Like you need to go find a job, right? Like that's, that's a scale and a maturity level whereby you need to start kind of proving that you're a real business. Right. And so what is that going to do? That is largely, I think, going to force these direct brands to stop marketing so aggressively. Right. Right now, the conversation yeah. has been, how do you shift? How do you shift marketing dollars from social to something else? Streaming, 
has been a big one. TikTok, stuff like that. Um, yeah. You know, new platforms for marketing, not not how do you cut back on marketing? That hasn't been as much of the conversation, right? But it's the biggest lever all these companies have to pull. So they're going to have to weigh marketing versus sales. And this is the Buffett where you're going to see yeah. people are swimming naked, right? This is the companies that can go from 20% marketing spend as, you know, relative to sales to, you know, I, I think rational levels are in the low single digits, but call it 10% just as a way station. You know, what does that do to your top line? Yeah. And it gets back to the repeat full right. price selling, right? Like, are, are you going to have repeat right. spending? Are those customers that were there for you five years ago going to come back? Right. And this is why it all starts from a product right. standpoint, right? So this is this year and next year are going to be the years that I think that really gets tested. Because if you're still spending into that aggressive top line, because that's always been the thesis, mind you, right? That we're spending a lot because we're just right. gaining customers and those customers are going to be loyal. And then we're at a scale where we're profitable. Well, right. you're already 500 million in revenue. You think you're going to get to a billion in three years, and yet your EBITDA is still going to be flat? Like, come on, right? And so I think that's a big, yeah. a big stress test that's about to happen in the market. And the other, the other prediction I have would be that wholesale, you kind of mentioned it there, wholesale gets taken a lot more seriously than it has been historically. Yeah. For that same reason. Yeah, I think those are right? really spot on. Do you think that the growth expectations then will kind of reset not only in the public markets, but down into the private markets, you know, where two years ago, people were like trying to grow at 200, you know, I mean, I know it depends on the stage of the company, yeah. but like you know, 200% growth or hundred percent growth, you know, whereas people might be like, Hey, 50 is like a massive win. 25 is a win, you know, or do you think um, it doesn't trickle all the way down from public to, to private? This is, I mean, look, it's kind of where you started this conversation about why would anyone want to talk to me if it's just easier to go and kind of do the easy stuff that everyone else is doing. Like, but this is where I want the revolution to happen, right? That's exactly what I want to happen, right? And I, I think, again, it speaks to what metrics are going to matter on a pitch deck, right? Can you put, people have already stopped putting LTV to CAC on their pitch decks, right? Like that's almost like a laughable metric at this point, because if you're telling me that your LTV to CAC is so great, and then on the next slide, you're spending 30% of your sales on marketing. Like there's a disconnect there. And one, and one does not explain the other, right? I don't care if you get a one-year payback. Yeah. That's a crazily irresponsible amount of marketing, right? So I think the metrics will have to change. And the metrics will have to show, if I'm an investor, I want to know the profitability and the sustainability of the profitability. Going back to an Aritzia or a, a National Vision or a Boot Barn, why are you able to comp at 5% consistently? right? That's it. Right? Yeah. Sales are the lifeblood, right? Why is your top line sustainable? And those, the metrics that support that are full price spending, repeat spending, you know, auto ship in the case of a Chewy, stuff like that. So it's, it's, it's going to start having to sort of, we're going to have to invent metrics or really agree on metrics that show brand health to suggest top line health that then trickles down to underlying profitability. And so on the private side, I mean, one interesting conversation that's happening, like the churning group and this idea around like, what does content do for your business, right? So if it's not marketing, what is the real value of a consumer brand, right? And, and a lot of that is the organic engagement you have with your customer base, right? And so models like Food52 or Houdinki, you know, Meat Eater, everything that's in their portfolio, um, you know, speaks to a capacity to engage a customer that, that moves well beyond marketing into an actual community of people. Um, and so I, I think you'll start seeing mm. private capital flow to businesses that they understand there's sort of structural supports for engagement more so than just an overbloated marketing budget. And those companies that can't do that, yeah. don't get capital, right? You know, and, that, and, that, and that'll be a healthy, yeah. that'll be a healthy cleansing, right? You starve the market of companies that were just overblown marketing budgets. And you're left with a sort of a healthier underlying base of competitively advantaged businesses. And, and hopefully that's how it flows out. Um, I think that's true. I think that will happen, but we'll see. Yeah. Well, that's, a, I think, a terrific place to stop. I mean, that's, I, I think you just dropped a huge uh, gem <laughs> there of wisdom among many during this conversation. Um, Dylan, thanks so much for being on. Stuff. I really hope you uh, yeah, right.
Yeah, no, I just, that part of that same equation is that scale is going to be smaller, right? You're not going to, you're not going to fund these yeah. brands with the hopes of being billion dollar, $20 billion brands. You're going to fund these businesses with hopes of being a hundred to 500 and sustainable, right? And free cash flow positive, but it's just going to, yeah. we're going to have, and I already talked to another investor the other day, you know, we're going to have to think about scale differently, you know, and I think that's going to be another yeah. hard awakening for, for people. Yeah. Okay, no, it's great to be yeah, here. Yeah, agreed. Yeah, thank you so much. Well, and I can't wait to do this again soon because uh, there's so much more to explore. Yeah, and it's going to change. <laughs>